السلام علیکم السلام علیکم و رحمت الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم الحمد لله رب العالمین و صلی الله علی محمد و آله الطاهرین اللهم صل علی محمد و آل محمد When it comes to the issue of prophethood prophethood is a direct emanation and follows directly from Tawheed. Now I don't want to go through Tawheed again. I, I've given many lectures even eight months ago here we first started a lengthy discussion on Tawheed. So I'm assuming we're all speaking on the same wavelength but just in case some of you have never listened to any lecture on Tawheed I'll just give two or three sentences on that and then we can progress. Uh, what we mean by Tawheed, you know, one of Allah's names is Yaw Mawjood. It's in the doors of Ahlul Bayt. And Allah's names are specific to Him. And no one can independently or originally have that name. They can manifest that name, but they can't be that name. In, the, in, in independent terms. So when Allah is the Mawjood, the existing one, it means only Allah exists and all else is a manifestation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And by Allah, we mean therefore pure existence. Not existence in a particular shape or form, but it's pure existence. And pure existence doesn't have a beginning. It doesn't have an end. It always was, is, will be. And moment to moment, this pure existence is manifesting. It never stops manifesting. That would be a deficiency. And therefore, something which has no beginning, has no end, and is always manifesting, this is a, an infinite entity, since pre-eternity to post-eternity, always creating. Creation is a manifestation of this pure existence. So pure existence is, since pre-eternity to post-eternity, always manifesting. Whatever you see, everything around you, is a manifestation of pure existence. Nothing is existence-free. That's impossible. Allahu Samad. And this Allah, that we call pure existence, everything is dependent upon Him. He has to be infinite. And if He's in infinite, there can only be one. You can't have two infinities. Now, everything you see around you, look at the different attributes surrounding you attributes of perfection that you see around you. Beauty, knowledge, power, hearing different noises. All these are manifestations of Allah's attributes. They're all manifestations of pure existence. And Allah's manifestations have no end. They're infinite, even in the material realm. And when they're infinite, with any given attribute that you see around you, like knowledge, beauty, power, hearing, um, seeing, all these are infinite also. Beauty in this world, it's infinite. There's no end to it. Power in this world, it's infinite. There's no end to it. And this shows that pure existence, which manifests infinitely, in different shapes and forms, this pure existence within it beholds all the attributes of perfection. And that's why the manifestations of pure existence, the manifestations of Allah, they emanate from pure existence. <coughs> A pure existence which has all these divine attributes of perfection. If it didn't have it, there would have been limitations in the realm of manifestation. 
So the infinite mercies and blessings that you see, it's because it emanates from pure existence, which is infinite in all attributes of perfection. As I said, nothing, no thing, is existence-free. Now that thing, with any degree of knowledge, power, beauty, hearing, seeing, but it's, it's not existence-free. It depends on existence. So what the philosophers call pure existence, the theologians call it Allah. That's what we mean. I think that much I'll, I'll stop, but as I say, it's a lengthy discussion and I didn't want to waste one lecture on it. But if you feel it's necessary, we can discuss one lecture on that later. So how does prophethood now follow? If you have an entity that has all the divine attributes of perfection in the most absolute sense, it would be requiring that such an entity where all wisdoms or manifestations of pure existence all guidance that you see in the realm of manifestation, in the realm of creation, it's a manifestation of pure existence. An absolute entity of absolute perfection, it would be requiring that they, first of all, create and create without sleep. We said before that Allah creates and he's been creating and manifesting since pre-eternity to post-eternity. There's no beginning. If you were to assign a day like the Christian God, the, the Christians assign, where he rests on a particular day and doesn't manifest and doesn't create, that would be a deficiency attributed to absolute perfection. A rational mind can say I'm after a higher entity, because this entity of yours wasn't manifesting. Not that Allah, it's a duty of Allah to create. It's a necessary existential attribute that creation is a necessary attribute of Allah. It follows from pure existence. Not that there's a duty upon Allah, it just is. If you're pure existence, you're manifesting moment to moment. If you were not to manifest, it would be a deficiency. Now, what you're manifesting in creation, namely also, aside, aside from everything else, but people, these people need to be guided. Now, if you're absolute perfection, the issue is, do you communicate with the people? One of Allah's names is Mutakallim. He talks, he communicates. Takallum means expressing that which is within you. For example, knowledge. You're expressing that which is within outwards. Does Allah communicate in this way? Well, yes, it's one of his names. All the talkings that surround us, even this whistling that you see, some of the brothers doing, these are all manifestations of Allah's mutakallim the chirping of the birds the, the river sound someone swearing at you that's also a manifestation of Allah's mutakallim and that's why the Imams when they would swear at them they would see this is a dialogue with Allah they wouldn't get drowned in the negative mannerisms of the other side and the Holy Prophet would pray for the person would even, you know, always, yes. He wouldn't get sidetracked. So we believe in a talking God, a communicating God. In, in the West today, there's a lot of literature where it speaks of a universal consciousness, but there's a hidden agenda in that because that universal consciousness doesn't speak. And to those who believe it speaks, it speaks to everyone. And therefore, they want to get rid of the aspect of the Sharia, of religion. We believe in a talking God. But who does Allah talk to? What does He say? Who deserves to be talked to? Can we be talked to? Yes. 
Do we have the qualifications though? The fact that Allah talks, communicates, it's a definite, otherwise we would be attributing deficiency to Him. All the talking that happens in the realm of manifestation, it means pure existence beholds this attribute also. But the thing is, here in the West, those people who speak about universal consciousness, they want to make religion each to their own. They want to attack this organized so-called religion. They want to attack the Sharia. This Sharia is very important. And even the enemies of Islam, it's the Sharia which is a major part which is bothering them. They want to get rid of the Sharia. They want a globalized culture with values to their own liking and they want to make those values universal. The biggest barrier to that is these, the Sharia that exists. And so these kind of ideologies you have to be careful. They look attractive and they may even share some commonality with Islam. But we shouldn't be deceived. We get our knowledge from somewhere else. So the question is, we believe in a talking God, a communicating God, mutakallim. And so who does Allah communicate with? Allah is absolute perfection. It would only be requiring that if Allah wants to assign a successor, a representative on his behalf, so that Allah talks to them, to guide the people. He is absolute guidance, and he is absolutely, he has wisdom. It would be requiring that that person succeeds Allah successfully. What I mean is, a successor of Allah, a Khalifa of Allah, is one who succeeds Allah in the attributes of Allah. The more you manifest Allah's attributes, the more that you incorporate the divine attributes of Allah, the more a successor of Allah, a Khalifatullah, you are. Now when Allah wants to give a protocol of life to people to be guided, who would he go through? Who would he choose as a successor? We all manifest attributes of Allah to more or less degrees. Allah though here to assign his successor, he would choose one who maximally manifests his attributes. If Allah was to choose someone to represent him, whilst there's someone else who manifests his attributes more, that would be a deficiency attributed to his wisdom. That would be a deficiency attributed to his perfection. That. And here we see that the aspect of khilafah and successorship, it's a rational thing. You don't necessarily need a hadith to tell you who is the successor, for example, of Allah, or who is the successor of the Prophet, or who is the successor of the successor of the Prophet, and so on and so forth. And who is the successor today? And during occultation, who is the successor? These are all rational truths. These, we can evaluate it rationally. How? Who, who is the successor of Allah? Who manifests Allah's attributes in a given time, in a given area, in a given geography? Who manifests Allah's attributes most? of all the people who would claim to be a prophet at the time of revelation imagine there are a few claimants to prophethood how can we tell who is a prophet the answer is you look at them those who claim to be a prophet and see which one succeeds Allah more which one manifests Allah's attributes more there, you found the Prophet, you found the Khalifa. Even if, God forbid, you did your bit to investigate and you, you believed someone else was the Prophet, 
And that person was an imposter. Here you would, you would be forgiven because you rationally went through it. But you found the wrong mistake. Although it's very unlikely for that to happen. Because you see the life of the Prophet and you see the life of other people. You see how the Prophet has educated, nurtured, has acted, his generosity, his justice, his forgiveness, all these. And when you compare it with other people, there's no comparison. And when you want to find, when we say Imamat is an offshoot of Nabuwa, of prophethood, the same there. When you want to find the successor of the Prophet, you have to see who is manifesting Allah's attributes more. And that's a rational endeavor. And here you have to read about them, study them, their life, their stories, their actions, what they did, what they achieved, their students, their products, who they gave to society, all these things together. A successor of Allah, a Khalifatullah, is one who manifests Allah's attributes maximally in any given era. In the time of the Prophet, maximally. In the time of Nabi Isa, at that time, who manifested Allah's attributes maximally? In the time of Nabi Musa, the same. Now, the maximal manifestation of Allah's attributes in one time and the maximal manifestation of Allah's attributes in another time, it can be different. We'll come to that later, another time. So here, with now the story is changing now a bit with prophethood, because now we've understood Tawheed, absolute perfection, pure existence, and now we want, Allah wants to have a representative on earth. They have to be a representative of, of Allah succeed Allah's attributes and they would be the Khalifa on earth whoever that is so that's a a rational proof for the necessity of having a prophet because it would be attributing deficiency to absolute perfection if Allah would never to assign a prophet and it's a rational requirement also that the prophet be in synchronicity with pure existence. There has to be a synchronicity between pure existence and the Prophet. There has to be a harmony. The harmony is that the Prophet is maximally manifesting the attributes of Allah. That's the harmony. If in one attribute you see, a pro a, a, in quotes, a Prophet not manifesting Allah's attribute, that would be an imposter. Now with Prophet, we didn't have imposters, but with the coming of the 12th Imam, there are going to be many imposters. And there it's going to be very difficult for you to rationally evaluate of these imposters, which is the 12th Imam. Well, I should rephrase that. Amongst these people who are imposters and who is the 12th Imam. Here, the rational answer is, <coughs> the one who manifests Allah's attributes most. But that's a rational endeavor. Sometimes if the heart is impure, if the heart is contaminated by the worldly life, although you know everything about Imamat, the heart won't recognize the 12th Imam. Even today, for example, there may be two people, one of them very pious, one of them very impious. But the impious person is very popular before people. And the people love him. The pious, they don't recognize him. They're both there to equal degrees. It's a theoret theoretical example. I don't want the mind to wander off anywhere. Yes. But the reason is that since you are impious, you're in synchronicity with the impious person. And actually, the shaitan will make their attributes very adorning to you. It's all about, you know, prophethood, imamat, tawheed. It's a function of the heart. The heart has to recognize it. Yes. So, here, the prophet would have to be someone who maximally manifests 
not someone who manifests Allah's attributes, but at the same time there's someone else who manifests them more. That would go against Allah's justice, His wisdom. Now, with the Holy Prophet, Allah has assigned him as the Khalifa. He's endorsed him. Sometimes Allah endorses the successors. Sometimes He doesn't. That's up to us to, in, to find the successor. Now, here, the Holy Prophet, therefore, we believe, is a manifestation of Allah's attributes to the maximum degree. So, aside from the physical entity of the Holy Prophet, the reality of the Holy Prophet is a manifestation of Allah's attributes. Even one of Allah's attributes, attributes is will, one who has will, mukhtar. Yes, here the Holy Prophet's will is annihilated in the will of the Prophet, in the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. His words are Allah's words, his actions are Allah's actions. It's like the moon and the sun. The moon just reflects the light of the sun. It's nothing itself. It's of no intrinsic value itself. It's just a reflector of the sun. The prophets too. They're reflecting the attributes of Allah. That's the reality of the prophet. Now there may be people today in the Amazon, in Africa, in the jungles of Africa, in Australia, that they have never heard of the Prophet, but they do incorporate these at divine attributes of Allah. They do incorporate. To, we'll speak about this in the next session. But to the degree they're incorporating, they are saying, Ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah. To the degree they're incorporating the attributes of Allah. Because the reality of the Prophet is a manifestation of Allah's attributes. And they are incorporating it to X, Y, Z degree. To that degree, they are saying the Shahada. But there may be a Muslim who verbally says the Shahada every day, but they're manifesting lesser of Allah's attributes than that person. The equation differs. We'll speak about that another time. Then, there's an issue of the Holy Prophet then brings the book. The book also is God's word. And is a manifestation of all of Allah's attributes. But with the book, the Quran, we call it the silent book. Whereas with the Prophet, we call him the talking book. But the reality of the Prophet and the reality of the Quran is one. And to explain that, we say that they both manifest Allah's attributes <coughs> maximally. If it was possible to manifest Allah's attributes more than what the Prophet is ma manifesting and more than what the Quran is manifesting, Islam wouldn't have been the last religion. <coughs> so, with previous religions, although we'll mention that later because I don't want to mix two things together. So the reality of the Prophet and the reality of the Qur'an is one. Allah's mani attributes manifesting. And so we believe, and this is very important in, ta in tafsir, and in all these centuries, Allah Metabo Taboi says, no one's paid attention to this tafsiri point. It's incredible for someone like Allah to make this claim. He says, this is the first time after 14 centuries. And then he says, and this was the method of the Imams in tafsir. And I am now explaining it. After 14 centuries, we've missed out. Now, what is that? It's to do with the Ahwadith. You know, there are some people who say, we only listen to Ahadith, the Qur'an we can't understand. There are some people who say, only the Qur'an, the Ahadith, they, they have less faith towards the Ahadith. Where they're both lacking a very, or missing a very important point here. 
And the point is that the Holy Prophet and his successors, through the Quran, to the verse of the Quran, they came with different accounts and speeches and recounted many statements. But when they were saying these ahadith, saying these things, it was from the verses of the Holy Quran. So no, I shouldn't say hadith, but no statement of the Prophet was unrelated to the Quran. It was all a verse of the Quran in a different way. It was extrapolated from the Quran. The Prophet's statements are not an independent, separate identity from the Qur'an. When we say the Qur'an is manifesting all of Allah's attributes, that manifesting can manifest as a hadith also, as statements of the Holy Prophet. But he used the Qur'an to bring these statements. So, when someone says, we don't understand the Qur'an, only the Ahadith. Well, the Prophet got those statements from the Qur'an. Those statements aren't disassociated with the Qur'an. If you understand that, it, you must understand the Qur'an. They're not mutually exclusive. You do a tafsir of the Qur'an via the Qur'an, and then you say it to the people, then people narrate it, it becomes a hadith. Not that independent from the Qur'an, the Prophet gives a statement. Now this is very important in relation to the synchronicity of, between the Qur'an and the Prophet, this point arises. Now I'll just give one example now, and one example later, which it, it will be more relevant in later discussions. For example, there's one verse in the Holy Qur'an that says, وَلَوْ تَكُونُوا كَالَّذِينَ نَسُوا اللَّهِ Don't be like those who forget Allah. فَأَنْسَاهُمْ أَنْفُسَهُمْ The result would be, if you forget Allah, that Allah will make them forget themselves. Allah will make them forget their souls, their selves. You forget Allah, the consequence is, you will forget yourself. Okay, so look, this is a, it's a statement given here in the Qur'an. Forgetting Allah, all statements have a subject and they have a predicate. For example, the cat is sitting on the mat. The cat is the subject. Sitting on the mat is the predicate. The predicate is as attributed to the cat. Those who forget Allah, that's the subject. The predicate is they'll forget their own souls. They'll forget themselves. Allah will make them forget themselves. Okay, so that's a statement. In logic, you can play around with statements in different ways, and in the conclusion, if the statement, the original statement was true, you can play with different ways, I'll explain in a minute, and then every conclusion you make, which emanates from that statement, is also true. For example, if I say all humans are talking entities, or talking, there's something called, in, in logic, they, they reverse and bring the contradictory form of the statement. Reverse means they put the subject and the predicate the other way around. Contradictory means the contradicting, if it says all humans, you say no humans. If it says talking, you say no talking, don't talk. The contradiction of it. So the reverse contradiction of all humans are talking, you would have to execute two steps here. First the reverse, you reverse the two, so all talking entities are, are you're reversing, so all talking entities are all human. You just reverse the subject and the predicate. All humans are talking, all talking entities are humans. 
But then you have to get the contradiction of all. And the contradiction is non-talking entities are non-human. Yes? We have a lot of these in, in logic, in the Jose. There are eight different forms of fiddling with a proposition. If the, propos if the proposition is a true proposition, and the Quran, all the propositions are true, when you execute each of these eight upon that statement, all the conclusions that you get have to be true. So, the, if you reverse and get the contradiction, it will be all non-talking entities are human. Or non-human, sorry. All non-talking entities, they are non-human. It's true. Now, if you do that with this verse of the Qur'an, if you, if you forget Allah, you forget yourself. If you reverse, is it's what? If you forget yourself, you forget Allah. If you then make the contradictory form of it, it's what? Yes, if you know yourself, you'll know Allah. That's the hadith. Man arafa nafsa, faqad arafa rabba. You see, it was extracted from the Quran, from nowhere else. And then from here, the Prophet would give such a statement. But this is tafsir of the Quran via the Quran. Then the Prophet would then utter this statement. This then becomes a hadith, and someone narrates it. Now, this hadith isn't mutually exclusive from the Quran, it's intrinsically intertwined. It's a manifestation of the Quran. To say we only have hadith, not the Quran, you've lost the plot. You've neither understood hadith nor the Quran. <coughs> and also, to say only the Quran, not hadith. That doesn't make sense either. And then we have criteria. If the hadith doesn't fit with the Quran, the logic of the Quran, discard it. It's all because it's a natural emanation of the Quran. The hadith, the, the, the statement of the prophets, they can't be mutually exclusive to it. Although this is a marginal point, but when it comes to how do you prove the Quran and the legitimacy of the Quran, since many Muslims are uttering these things, I'm just mentioning as a marginal point, but I mean, one has to refer to more books on the matter. But how they prove the Quran, they do it through the Prophet. They prove the legitimacy of the Quran through the Prophet's being trustworthy, not lying, and Amin, and those kind of things. That, that, that won't do. That's not sufficient. That, there would be a fallacy involved here. The Quran explains itself. It's God's word. And the legitimacy of the Qur'an can be rationally substantiated and proven by itself, not through anyone else. And this, to say that something else has to prove the Qur'an or explain the Qur'an, you haven't understood the reality of the Qur'an yet. And Allah Metabotabi has very important passages on this point in Al-Mizan. Okay. So that was a second point I wanted to mention. Another point is that sometimes you may see these narrations where previous prophets saw our prophet when our prophet wasn't born. How are we going to explain that? And many people may explain it in a way which would be purely on a par with reincarnation the way they explain it because the Prophet didn't exist for example in the time of Adam salam, in the time of Noah salam. but what does it mean to say the Prophet had a saw the Holy Prophet Amir al-Mu'min, Lady Fatima, Imam Hassan, Imam Hussein 
and got guidance from them of how to repent, for example. What does that mean? <coughs> Here we shouldn't say that the, when Adam saw the prophet, it wasn't the physical prophet. The physical prophet was born 1400 years ago. He didn't exist, let's say, 12,000 years ago or 10,000, whatever. Here, the Qur'an refers to tamathulat. In many stories of the Qur'an, this too, those ahadith which speak of earlier prophets seeing the Holy Prophet, they are also visions. They're apparitions. And apparitions, like dreams, where the person though is awake, they're not asleep. It's a way of communicating that Allah does with the person. Allah's attributes, depending on what the, that prophet Adam, for example, needed, Allah's attributes would manifest in the form of the Holy Prophet. And Prophet Adam would have a vision of, prophet, of our Holy Prophet. But not our Holy Prophet as the one who was born 1400 years ago. The Prophet as a manifestation of Allah's attributes. Allah's attributes were manifesting. Here it was, what do I do to repent? And then Allah manifested and guided Adam how to repent in the form of a vision, an apparition, which was similar to the appearance of our Holy Prophet many, many years later. These are visions. Visions are okay to have. When we say the reality of the Holy Prophet is a maximum manifestation of Allah's attributes and Prophet Adam doesn't manifest Allah's attributes to the same degree, when Prophet Adam wants guidance from Allah, Allah will give him guidance. It may be through dreams, he's asleep. It may be once he's awake. But in both cases, the heart is seeing it. It's present before the soul. It's a product of the soul. And he has a vision of a figure. He may not recognize the figure. Who is this? This is Muhammad. This is Ali. This is Fatima. And so on and so forth. And listen to their guidance. But if you believe in a physical Prophet Muhammad in the time of Prophet Noah, that's going to be problematic. How are you going to explain that? So there was a physical Prophet. Our Holy Prophet existed in the physical form. Then he died, then he was born, he, he became potential again, and through sperm and everything again, through the womb of a mother, he became actual again. In another body, not the same body, that other body has gone now. It's through another womb, another, yes. So that would be reincarnation. That, we, we don't accept that. Yes, okay. So I think I'll stop here for now, and we'll continue, inshallah, later. وصلى الله على محمد وآله الطاهرين It's in chapter Suratul Al-Hash Yes um, Towards the end I don't know the exact, the exact number I don't know the verse number And, uh, How can we prove Quran from Quran? Yes So here the claim of the Qur'an is Tawheed. We first have to prove that absolute perfection is that pure existence. That's that lecture on Tawheed. If you remember, we have to first prove that Allah is absolute perfection, is pure existence. And then He has all the attributes of perfection. This can be objectively now taken from the Qur'an. This can then be objectively compared with other books before Islam and man-made fabrications after Islam. And you see, the way that Tawheed has been proven, has been manifested. Previous books don't manifest it as much. It's an objective evaluation. You just have to look at it. And books after Islam who claim mono to be monotheist, they've added nothing to the Tawheed. If they were to have really added something that the Qur'an didn't have in relation to pure existence, in relation to Tawheed, in relation to perfection, then yes, we would, we would accept that as the next religion, a new prophet and everything.
Yes, that's how it comes. Yes. Yes, it's your soul that you'll Sorry. you'll forget. So no, no, but well, you have a soul now. Yes, the hereafter exists right now. You're building it moment to moment. Yes, but you'll be oblivious to your soul right now. Yes, but in relation to the first question, the d the degree of forgetting it's not zero or hundred percent. It's a graded system. To that degree, you forget Allah. In proportion to that, you'll forget yourself. Um, now, in a, every 24-hour period, in Salat you remember Allah. But when you go to work, when you go to study at university, when you're with your spouse, when you're with your children, you get drowned in the manifestation, not the manifesto. Yes. And to, so you forget a lot. And only in, let's say, maybe... 10, 20 minutes a day you may recall him to start off with. So here you have to make a connection first academically and then incorporate it in your heart with everything that you see around you or everything that you do every day from the brushing of your teeth to going to sleep. You have to make a list of Allah's names on one side and then these actions that you do and say this brushing of teeth which attribute of Allah is being manifested here? When I'm studying which attributes am I in the presence of? When I see a tree, which attributes, yes. For example, when you brush your teeth, the shape of beauty, your musawwir, the purifier, your mutahir, and so on and so forth. Yes. And like this, then it has to be incorporated. You have to really truly believe that Allah is attributing. And that's through invocations, azkar, in the middle of the night when you're alone. And then slowly, it becomes second nature, and more and more, you are not forgetting Allah. When, when the Holy Prophet was sworn at, he still didn't forget Allah. He was in the presence of Allah. He didn't get drowned in the manifestation. Yes. Yes. No, I don't mind with questions outside. The point was, I didn't want the lecture to be um, to be compromised so once the questions finish in relation to the lecture yes it's okay you can ask questions on other things too it's okay it's just I wanted everyone to understand the lecture and then well, not to mix things up yes 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 Yes. And we look at how he was in relation to Allah. Yes. And see how close he was. And uh, to what extent he got. Yes. Muslims know. And he knew Allah's perfection. So, can you talk a bit about that? that um, Sometimes uh, a lot of youths and we fail to understand that he reached such a high realm, yet he's below th beneath the hellfire. So and and in relation to that, in the application of our life, how you said, can you give some similarity as to the danger, as to how that it can apply to us to that level? The thing is with Iblis. His authority cannot penetrate the mukhlasin. It's in the Quran. The mukhlasin are those who don't have an ego. The ego has been slaughtered. And their words are Allah's words. Their actions are Allah's actions. Even you, for example, for a moment, temporarily, you may have been a mukhlas. For example, you went in a trance, a certain relationship with Allah, where there was no ego, what you were saying was Allah's words. What you did was Allah's words. It's possible to be a mukhlas, but the ego has to go. There should be no I. Iblis has no authority over them. 
Now, what does it mean to be a mukhlas, the, the way of action, the route to becoming one? In one story, Iblis says to Nabi Musa that my Tawheed is stronger than yours. Now here, this is Iblis' foolishness. This was the cause of his fall. Nabi Musa said, why? He said, because when Allah said to you, look at the mountain, you looked. When Allah said to me, look at Adam, I didn't. I only look at, focus on Allah. Only Allah. You see, he didn't see Adam as a manifestation of Allah. He didn't see it. He didn't see Allah in the manifestation. He saw them as mutually exclusive. Allah one side and someone mutually exclusive from Allah on the other side. He thought that was a strong point. Nabi Musa looked at the mountain. A manifestation of Allah, it was a strong manifestation. He died spiritually. The mukhlas people can only have their egos slaughtered if they believe that it's all Allah in dimension. Kulla yawmin hu fi shan. It's all him. It's all pure existence. There's nothing independent from pure existence. When you say, I didn't look at Adam, only Allah, you haven't understood. It's a limited Allah. Once it's a limited Allah, you're still, you may be mukhlis, but you're not mukhlas. You may do many good deeds, and you may dedicate it to Allah, but it's not the real Allah yet. Those who are in the presence of the real Allah, pure existence, where they see everything as a man of Him manifesting, they can't sin. They're always, like the Imams, the Prophets, they were always in the presence of a pure existence. They don't sin. They can't sin. Um, so, yes, so here, that was the downfall of Iblis. And that's why it's important. Tawheed is important. And then the representative of Tawheed is important. Because some, well, there's no problem. Then the representative of the representative, but eventually, during occultation, when you want to find the representative, if they don't have, mukh, if they're not mukhlas, and have a deficient worldview, they're going to be susceptible to satanic penetration. We'll talk about that later, I think, a bit more. This, this may be the application of this reality. So we can say that certain scholars, we can say, sorry, uh, we can say in extension to that, then the application in, uh, that certain scholars can fit that. It's possible, yes. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, come, yes. Uh, you talked about Allah's manifestation of his attributes. And you said manifestation that, uh, of what, sorry? Manifestation of Allah's attributes. Yes, yes, sorry, yes, yes. And you said that uh, the one who manifests more, yes. Allah makes him Khalifa Allah. Yes, yes. So, where the prophets, 124,000 prophets, yes, were yes. divinely appointed, or they had after manifesting the Allah's attributes, then they were being uh, appointed as a prophet. Yes. So, so prophets may have been, because prophethood yeah, prophet. is, it's a, it's a, it's a, um, like a job. It's a, it's a state, a status. It's a position. Mm -hmm. Prophethood. Mm -hmm. It's like a job. Mm -hmm. It has responsibility. It's a position. That's why there's an end to prophethood. It ends. Who fits this job? The prophets were assigned as prophets in different times. They were assigned with this responsibility in, at different times. One at 40, one at 20, one at birth. But that's not important. That's a job. But who would be assigned this job? They have to be a wali. A wali is one who is close to Allah. Being close to Allah means they are more Allah-like. Being more Allah-like means they manifest Allah's attributes more and more. That's why they're more Allah-like. So that's, being more Allah-like is a qualification in order to be assigned prophethood. You see? So they had this qualification before being assigned prophethood. Now, were they assigned immediately when they had it? No. They were a wali for years and years. But they weren't given the responsibility of prophethood yet. Some were given at birth, someone at 10 years of age, 20, 30, 40. 
some for this group of people, some for a larger group of people, some for their family members only, some for the ummah, some for a nation, some for a tribe. If we take this criteria, then uh, you'll find that Prof. Uh, Jesus had said from the cradle that I am the messenger of Allah. So was he manifesting Allah's attributes in Alam Arwa or something like that? And you'll find that uh, Janabi Luqman, if you go into the commentary of the Quran and says that Janabi Luqman was given a choice to become a prophet. Yes. And he said, no, it's a very huge responsibility I cannot take. So, a little bit, I just want to... Yes, yes. So, with Nabi Isa, no, he was a, at that time, at that time, he was a maximum manifestation of Allah's attributes. Not before birth. As a child. That was the miracle. At such a young age. That degree of welaya that Nabi Isa had, other prophets more or less may have had it, but they were given this responsibility later. With Nabi Isa, the issue was because of the nature of the immaculate birth, they wanted to prove his prophethood through this way. Whereas with other prophets, they were born naturally. There was no need at that time to declare it. Yes. With uh, Nabi Lughman, we have to look at those traditions a bit more. Because if you maximally manifest Allah's attributes, it's a duty. It would be a deficiency attributed to Allah not to uh, give prophethood to someone who maximally manifests Allah. And it would be a deficiency attributed to Lughman if Lughman was maximally manifesting Allah's attributes at a given time and he said no. If he said no, when there was no one else higher than him, that would be a deficiency. It's like a marja, a religious authority, who knows he's the most learned. I mean, that never happens, but let's say someone really knows they're the most learned and they don't guide the masses. That's a deficiency. In the case of Moses, yes. he asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that make my brother Harun yes. to be my... Yes. Spokesperson. Yes. And after that, Harun was being appointed as a prophet. Yes. So was it like uh, he is the one who appointed Harun, or maybe he requested Allah Subhanahu wa Taala to make Harun? Yes. Prophet. That story um, is quite an important story here, and it shows Nabi Musa was of a higher status than Harun. The question is, so why did he ask for Harun to accompany him? And yes, and. The answer which Imam Khomeini has given is that the more, the higher your spiritual station, the higher your ascension and presence of Allah is, the more difficult it's going to be to explain it to the masses. It's going to be very difficult. The more the abstract things, it's more difficult. The lesser your spiritual status, the easier it is. Nabi Musa was at a very high there. The, the, the knot in his tongue, the uqdatam min lisani, it's not a physical knot. Or those stories that a, 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 a hot stone was put in his tongue and it caused a physical disability. That, that's, it's all, these are Israeliyat. Yes, all these are false, yes. It was a spiritual station. And, and prophets have difficulty to explain very high truths to the masses. It's a knot in their tongue, yes. At least for a period of time, yes. yes. Although, we're going to discuss other topics related to this as we progress, it's just since you've asked it, yes. Okay, so. so you mean this is the reason why he asked for his brother? Yes, yes, Imam Khomeini gave this reasoning, yes. Okay. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.